I've been told and promised some very exciting talks this afternoon to keep you from falling into a postprandial stupor. First of these is by Professor Matthew Tacheri. Matt is a paleoanthropologist in the Human Origins Program of the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian Institution's Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Lakehead University in Ontario and his PhD from Arizona State University in 2007. His research interests relate to the evolution and functional morphology of humans and our great ape cousins, and in particular, to the eight tiny but complex bones that make up our wrists. Matt employs the latest cutting-edge technology, such as laser digitizers, CT scanners, and magnetic resonance imaging to analyze these bones in three dimensions. It's probably fitting that Matt should have a strong interest in the wrist. Wrist mobility is critical for playing instruments such as the piano. And Matt is an accomplished and highly acclaimed blues pianist, opening for the likes of B.B. King, a real musician. I can't even get tickets for B.B. King. That's a hint, Matt. Matthew Tocheri, why the tiny wrist bones of a hobbit tell us so much about a big chapter in human evolutionary history. Too kind. You can use the mouse to advance. Okay, do you have a little clicker? Yeah. Clicker. This is for All right, is my mic working? Sounds like it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Fred. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, I have opened for BB King, but uh, it was only uh, twice and with a with a great band from Arizona, where I played uh, during my graduate career there. But now I'm uh, rather than consumed with the 88 keys, I'm more consumed with 80, eight eight wrist bones. Uh, and the extraordinary story I think these bones can tell us about our own evolutionary history, and in this case, oh, you can't hear them? Can, can you turn on the, the wireless? Is it on? Can I speak louder? Sure, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so the tiny wrist bones of a hobbit and what they tell us about not only its evolutionary history but also our own. Now, the first question I want to sort of introduce this topic with is, well, why the hand? Why the wrist? Why is this important? Well, there's 27 bones in each of our hands, okay? That makes 54 bones total, and as many of you may know, there are roughly 200 bones in our adult skeleton. So over 25% of all the bones in our body come from our hands. These organs are also directly involved in, in uh, manipulative behaviors for us, but also locomotor and manipulative behaviors in all our non-human primate relatives. And very importantly, wrist morphology has long been known to distinguish apes from monkeys, great apes from lesser apes, and even African apes and humans from orangutans. And even Huxley, over 100 years ago, was aware of this. And this is one of the pieces of evidence that Huxley used to argue that African apes were our closest living relative to the exclusion of the orangutan. So this is not something that should be considered new in any case. And in today's talk, I'm going to specifically talk about a particular region of the wrist which occurs over on your thumb side, or as I might sometimes say, the radial side, because it's the side your radius is on. And even though it seems invisible to us, underneath our palm, we have a bunch of tiny bones oriented here like your metacarpals, and then these are the carpals I'm going to talk about to you today. Now, in, in all of us sitting here in this room, we all have the same anatomy here. We have a thumb metacarpal, an index finger metacarpal, as well as four tiny wrist bones lodged on this half of the wrist. In the middle here, we have a bone called the trapezoid. And I like to call it the monkey in the middle because it's surrounded by all these other bones. And for those of you that are, that are in college here, and you may have roommates, right? And when you fit five or six people all into one, one uh, place to live, what has to happen? Any ideas? Compromise, right? And it's the same thing here. There's only so much real estate. And so as one bone changes in its shape, other bones have to uh, change as well in order to have the whole structure function properly. Now, if we look at our closest living relative, the chimpanzee, we can see that they have all the same bones. But again, you'll notice oops, the differences in proportion. But you still have the thumb metacarpal, the index metacarpal, the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the scaphoid. So we can begin to ask ourselves, well, these differences between ourselves and chimpanzees, when did they evolve? 
Well, we can first do a comparison to see, well, how do they differ? And in this case, almost all the differences we see, I think, are related to changes in the trapezoid, changes to this bone in the middle. And as it changes, all the other bones show uh, re reciprocal morphology that compromises themselves so that they can fit with that particular trapezoid shape. And in us, essentially, our trapezoid is very squared off in front of our palm. And so that you can see almost a, a pound sign where all the articular surfaces are oriented perpendicular to one another, or sorry, in parallel to one another. Whereas in chimpanzees, we see a very different configuration. Now the question is, which is primitive and which is derived? But we can test this to, by looking at our other close relatives, such as gorillas and orangutans and other non-human primates. And when we do this, we realize that this area of the wrist is more similar among all those species, rather than, and it's different in us. And because we know that chimpanzees are our closest living relative, then we know that the common ancestors we share with chimps, and gorillas, and orangutans, say, basically have this primitive pattern in this area of the wrist. And we can say with confidence that sometime during our evolutionary history, this area of the anatomy changed. The question is when? Now, because we're primates, I like to use color coding to, to get these points across, and I apologize to my colleague Bill Jungers, who always complains to me because he's colorblind. But for most primates who can see colors, what you're seeing here are basically the homologous surfaces, either the non-articular area in pink, or the reciprocal, or the homologous articulations for other wrist bones. And right away, you can begin to see how different our trapezoid, looking at it from the palm, is from what we see in chimpanzees. Similarly, the bones that the trapezoid articulates show concomitant changes in their morphology that mimic what's happening to the change in the trapezoid. And again, we can say with confidence that this, these are the derived conditions, and what we see at our non-human primate relatives are the primitive conditions. Now, is this because when we're one and two years of age, we really like to bang pots and pans together? Or perhaps our hominin ancestors banging stone tools together? Not at all. We can go back into early fetal development and see that at this stage, which is roughly an embryo between 10 and 12 weeks with a cross-section through the wrist right here, you can see the mesenchyme, which is the precursor to our skeleton, first undergoing cartilaginous replacement and already you can begin to see the trapezoid squaring off and the muscle system here, in particular the flexor carpi radialis, already orienting a position which is very derived. And we don't see that in our non-human primate relatives because in this case the trapezoid is much more triangular shaped. And so you can think of it as a pyramid. And the trapezoid is shaped like this. So when it's lodged in your wrist, your trapezium and thumb sit out in front of the palm of your hand. But in us, what's happened is the trapezoid has expanded like this. And essentially, it's pushed our thumb out to the side of our hand. And this is something that's very derived and unique in, the, in our evolutionary history. Now, what is this for? Well, we can take a couple guesses. What this does is it changes. All the muscles are essentially very similar in terms of their attachments. And so it changes how all these muscles are functioning. In particular, it shows that the thumb is now positioned to load the wrist transversely across it, rather than up and down in this direction. And so we can see that because of the orientation of our thumb metacarpal joint, carpal metacarpal joint, which is oriented roughly perpendicular to the rest of our carpal metacarpal joints. And so almost any position we put our thumb in, we all have joint surfaces that then are primed to handle any of the forces or loads that are coming across in this direction. Whereas in the primitive condition, it's just not designed effect effectively for that. And similarly, if we take the capitate out of the wrist, what we can see is these derived changes in shape also change the all the articular surfaces. So that you end up with a huge articular surface made up of the scaphoid and the trapezoid together, so that no matter how you end up pulling your thumb in when you flex your, your thumb musculature, you're setting up a large area of joint surface to handle that load, which is just not there in the primitive condition. We also see differences in how the metacarpals basically structure, add to this structure, where in humans, the second metacarpal 
stabilizes the trapezium, the trapezoid, and the capitate because it sits on all three of them. And so when it does, it stabilizes it so that these three, all these carpal bones, remain motionless relative to another to ensure that those articulations are there for one another and can, and can handle that load. Whereas in the primitive condition, the second metacarpal, when the flexor carpi radialis pulls, it pulls the second metacarpal into the wrist. So that what happens is the trapezium and the capitate on either side ride up against it and stabilize it from moving back and forth. And so with these changes, we can begin to look at the fossil record to see, well, when and where did these, do these changes evolve and in what behavioral context? Well, we can first look at Neanderthals, our closest relative that's extinct, and essentially we can see that they share the derived changes that we see in our, in our hands. They have all the derived morphology that we see in any one of us. And that helps us answer this first question, which is, What's going on at this last common ancestor we share with them? Well, given that we share these, morph these morphologies, we can be reasonably certain that we inherit it from a common ancestor. If we move beyond and we look at early Homo, Homo habilis from Olduvai, we see the scaphoid of OH7 still looking very African ape-like. If we look at capitates from Hadar in South Africa, we again see very primitive morphology. They show none of the derived characters that we see in this region of our wrists. And so we can be reasonably certain that the ancestors, the common ancestors we share with them, still have the primitive condition. Now this is quite interesting because we know that tools show up in the record much earlier than this. And so we have evidence of the behavior showing up well before we see any of these derived changes to our hand. And the earliest direct evidence of these changes comes in at 800,000 years ago, where a capitate attributed to Homo antecessor, a possible uh, ancestral candidate for humans and Neanderthals, has the derived condition. But essentially, in all fossil hominins that we see sort of past this point, that retain, that preserve this part of the anatomy, we see our kind of wrist. So this, as a context, sets up a really interesting test in terms of something like Homo floresiensis, as what kind of wrist does it have? Well, in 2004, when this paper came out, it blew my socks off. I remember reading it at a conference in Canada, and I was just beyond belief. And of course, you can imagine I tore through that paper trying to see if there were any hand or foot bones, and they mentioned that they did have hand and feet, foot bones, but they didn't say what. And then there was nothing in the paper about it, so I sort of assumed that, well, they just don't have perhaps this area of anatomy. But of course, as we all know, and I like to use this quote from J.R.R. Tolkien, at this point, the hobbits suddenly became, by no wish of their own, both important and renowned, and troubled the counsels of the wise and the great. <laughs> now, of course... That's, you know, we're, I'm being kind to those of us in the paleoanthropological community calling us wise and great, but in any case, I think it's a great quote. And so, for several years after this, I was still under the impression that they probably, there were no wrist bones, until, by coincidence, at the Smithsonian, Lorraine Cornish, a conservator from the British Natural History Museum, came by and gave us a little talk about her efforts going to Jakarta to help preserve some of these remains. And she put this slide up. Now, for everyone that was in the audience that day, and similar to the, you folks here today, when you see this picture, you probably glance around at the head, maybe down here at the feet and everything. But you can imagine me, knowing those slides I just showed you is exactly where I, what I was thinking of this before that point. Well, all I was concerned with was this, and what's going on right there. And Lorraine happened to have casts of these bones at that particular moment. And so, in that sense, it's a, it's a weird connection where uh, the only reason I have had the privilege of working with this material is because of a unique uh, sequence of circumstances where Mike Morwood decided to Google the hominin shoulder and came up with Susan Larson's name, and so emailed her. She went down the hall and got Bill Jungers, who then got Lorraine Cornish involved, and then, because of all those sequences, those casts ended up, by chance, at the Smithsonian the night before Lorraine was going to put them in the mail to, to give them to Bill Jungers. Well, this was the trapezoid that showed up, and I was immediately struck by it. 
and I'll go into more detail on that in a moment, and the scaphoid, and the capitate. So not only did it have wrist bones, but it had the exact wrist bones that are needed to look at this area of the anatomy and see, well, does it have the primitive condition or the derived one? And so we can ask ourselves this question. Do the hobbits have this wrist, or do they have the wrist that's primitive for our tribe as hominins? And so these are my uh, figures of laser scans that I've then segmented out the joint surfaces. And on top, these are basically individuals that come from close to the center of each of these distributions where we quantify this morphology. But up here, I like to call it my Sesame Street comparison because it is very much like one, which one of these looks like the other. And again, you can see, I think, very clearly that modern humans, early modern humans from the Middle East, like Kavsa, over 100,000 years old, and Neanderthals all share morphology that we just do not see in the African apes or orangutans. And so when we look at LB1, I think it's completely obvious. Well, it doesn't have any of the derived features. It looks essentially like what we would expect an early hominin, the morphology, to have. And if we look at the reciprocal morphology on the scaphoid, here notice in Pongo, in orangutans, they actually have nine bones in their wrist, whereas we only have eight. And the nine are created because the scaphoid is actually two bones, the centrale and the scaphoid proper. But in African apes and humans, these bones have fused and become one. So it's one of the characters that unites us as a clade with African apes. Well, again, because of that trapezoid expanding, what happens is it pushes the trapezium out onto the tubercle of the scaphoid. And the scaphoid tubercle becomes much more robust. And if we look at LB1 alongside as well OH7, we still see retentions of these primitive characters. And we see the absence of the derived characters that we see in us and Neanderthals. And when we quantify that, we get the same results. Similarly, if we look at the, the capitate, we have several capitates from us Australopithecus, no trapezoids. However, it's always been noted that all the Australopithecine trapezoids have a, or the capitates have a trapezoid articula articulation at the back, just like we see in, in Pan and Pongo. But unlike the change that we see in modern human capitates and Neanderthal capitates, which have to articulate with this expanded trapezoid, which changes the articulation from the back of the hand and puts it up to the front and enlarges in size. And so if we look at LB1's capitate, again, it's clear. It shares none of the derived features that we see in the clade that includes modern humans and Neanderthals. And so, again, if we put them side by side between a modern human and a chimpanzee, I don't think you need to be a paleoanthropologist to recognize which ones look more similar to one another. Now, you can ask yourselves, well, is this pathology? Is there any way pathology could explain these features? I think the answer is no. And the reason is related to the development of these shapes. These shapes, as I noted, form early in the mesenchyme as it's being replaced by cartilage cells. This happens Within the, la within the first trimester, toward the end of the first trimester. We have three types of skeletal developmental disorders that can affect the wrist or the skeleton in general. Dysostoses are primary malformations of bone. They tend to affect the bone as organ, so as mesenchyme. And that's sort of underneath the, the platform of cell patterning. It changes it as the, as the mesenchyme is migrating to the areas where it will, will then form cartilage and then bone. But when this happens, it's usually unilateral, it's very random, and it's not necessarily associated with dwarfism or any other things that we might think of when we think of pathologies that may affect Homo floresiensis. If we look at disruptions, again, these are secondary malformations of bone, and this is due to some sort of environmental influence. But again, these will be unilateral, and you wouldn't expect, you'd expect random change, not sort of a perfect, uh, perfect change into the primitive condition. And finally, all of the the pathologies that are usually considered for explaining LB1, well, the genes that would be responsible for all of those pathologies don't express themselves until the third trimester, or in some cases, the late second trimester. 
Well, if those genes aren't even going to turn on to cause things to go wrong until then, well, these shapes have already formed. So it's highly unlikely that it would then take shapes that have already formed in the derived condition and somehow, poof, make them look like a chimpanzee. Now, we actually have more wrist evidence as well, and I'll just talk briefly about this. This wasn't discussed in the paper that we published in Science a few years ago, but there is a partial hamate, which will tell us a lot of information about the ulnar side of our hand and what's happening in, in the evolution of that. But also, when I went back to Jakarta with Bill Jungers a year and a half ago, I went back through some of the bags, and particularly I went through the bags from Spit 59, which is where LB1 was found in Sector 7, 5 meters, 90 centimeters, five meters and 90 centimeters below the surface of the cave, and we found the lunate. And so we're currently working on a comparative analysis of the lunate, which is important because the only wrist bone we have from Homo erectus happens to be a lunate from Jucodien. Otherwise, we have no fossil evidence of the wrist of Homo erectus. So all of you aspiring fossil hunters and, that are part of TBI and want to go look for the next Homo erectus skull, let me encourage you, find its wrist you can find the skull later. The wrist right now would be extremely valuable in terms of understanding not only the position of Homo floresiensis, but the evolution of this morphology within our genus. And similarly, on our most recent trip, having been inspired by finding the lunate, I went back through hundreds of bags from the excavations that Mike and Thomas were talking to you about, and through bags of bone fragments like this. Now, I don't know if you can read up here, but this is from Spit 50 of Sector 11. That's the layer, the 10 centimeter layer, that produced the second jaw, the second mandible of LB6. Well, and in this pile, this is the capitate of LB1, which I showed earlier. Well, this is what we found in that spit bag. We have another perfectly preserved capitate, this one from the right hand rather than the left. It's a little bit smaller than LB1, but otherwise displays all of the features that are primitive and shows none of the derived features that we would see in us or Neanderthals. Similarly, here's that hamate from LB1, a partial hamate. But now we have a complete hamate body, also missing the hamulus, and a third one. So even if you wanted to make the argument, while well, that left and right capitate, even though they're about a meter apart and with two different jaws, maybe they're from the same individual, well, I can assure you that no modern human has three hamates. It's impossible. And so now we have uh, doubled, essentially, the number of wrist bones we have from Homo floresiensis. And I think this will t be very informative at looking not only at the radial side of the hand, which we've so far looked at, but also the ulnar side. How am I doing for time? I'm good? OK. So in this case, I think it's really clear. When we look at the wrist evidence and where the hobbits fit, well, we know for sure that we do not share a common ancestor with them that we do with Neanderthals. Because it's likely that we inherit the wrist morphology that's carved in each and, one of, each and every one of our hands that we inherit from this common ancestor. And wherever the hobbits come from, they come from before that time. And the ancestor we share with them still has the primitive wrist. Now, of course, the wrist can't answer everything because it with any piece of skeletal evidence, it depends on the context of the primitive and derived features. And all the wrist can tell us is whether or not it belongs to this clade, this clade here that includes all the hominins that have this derived wrist. But we can be at least certain from the wrist evidence that we are more closely related to Neanderthals than we are to the hobbits. And if we lay all this evidence out, what do we see? What is, what is all this evidence telling us? Well, I think it's telling us that a very important evolutionary event occurred in our recent evolutionary history, wherein you have hominins already clearly adapted behaviorally to making and using stone tools, perhaps for as long as more than a million and a half years. But yet an event happens where our morphology undergoes secondary modifications, perhaps as a result of adaptation to those behaviors. Those are hypotheses that I'll probably continue to test my entire career. 
But at least we know that roughly about 800,000 years ago, for sure, we see evidence of our derived wrist anatomy. And it's after that that we see another big jump in technology where we see the origin and then diffusion of Middle Stone Age-like artifacts. And with Homo floresiensis, what we see are essentially behaviors as well as morphology that harken back to an earlier time of our shared evolutionary history with that, new, with that species. And essentially they're bringing tool behaviors as well as morphology that harken back to our own ancestors in Africa, perhaps between one and two million years ago. So again, why the hand? Why the wrist? Well, because in this case, just as wrist morphology helps us distinguish apes from monkeys, great apes from lesser apes, African apes and humans from orangutans, and yes, even hobbits and earlier hominins from modern humans and Neanderthals. And that's probably the most you ever want to think about the wrist, again, but I really appreciate your time and, and your ears. Thank you. Why is it doing this? I've got to get it. I've got to get this one off. Okay. And then to. Oh, okay. There you go. Thanks. Ah, uh, to be in tune with technology. Thank you, Matt. Next talk uh, this afternoon before coffee is by Professor Susan Larson. Susan is a professor in the Department of Anatomical Sciences at the medical school here at Stony Brook. She received her bachelor's degree from Kent State University and her PhD from the University of Wisconsin. Susan's research interests focus on the functional morphology of the musculoskeletal system in humans and our close primate relatives. Most of her work involves using experimental methods such as electromyography to test form function relationships so as to more confidently reconstruct the behaviors of fossils or extinct species. She's not averse to having needles stuck into the muscles of her arms with thin trailing wires attached to electronic recording devices in order to determine what muscles are actually used during particular activities. Susan is an internationally recognized scholar for her work on the shoulder and the upper limb. As Matt said, if you Google shoulder, you have Susan Larson. She's recently applied her knowledge to the analysis of the hobbit arms. Professor Larson, the hobbit shrug, the shoulder of Homo floresiensis and its implications for human evolution. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, staying till the afternoon. Uh, you have to excuse me, about 10 minutes ago I suddenly developed a tickle in my throat, of course, just before I have to give a talk. Okay, uh, so let's uh, just sort of start with some basics. Uh, why are we interested in human evolution? Well, uh, the obvious question is what we're interested in, where we came from, uh, how we got to be here, and so how do we go about answering these kind of questions? Well, mostly, we look to fossils. We look to the people who go out and dig those nine meter deep pits and, and uh, discover fossils of uh, various types. Now this is a uh, picture of, in fact, the uh, fossil known as Osteopithecus afarensis, or Lucy. Um, and it, you can see it's a relatively uh, complete skeleton, but even when we have something this complete, uh, in order to try and figure out what they were doing, how they were behaving, you have to make some functional inferences from the skeletal material. We have to try and reconstruct what their behavior might have been with this limited amount of information. 
Uh, so it, the first step in doing that is usually involves uh, making some comparisons. And most commonly, especially when dealing with early hominins like this one, uh, we're going to make comparisons between the fossil and modern humans and our nearest relatives, the living apes, and, and in particular the, the African apes and chimpanzees. Uh, so if, say for, if we're studying afarensis, we're going to make these comparisons between uh, chimpanzees and humans as the uh, most common kind of uh, way of starting our analysis. And uh, most of the work has been on lower limbs because of our interest in bipedalism. People now recognizing bipedalism was one of the first uh, uh, shifts that uh, uh, distinguished the human lineage from uh, other apes. Uh, and so studies have been done like this one and showing how uh, the orientation of the thigh bone, the femur, differs in uh, humans versus apes and how uh, early hominids are more like uh, the human condition. Uh, because of interest in uh, tool making and that sort of thing, uh, people have been very interested in hands and, and wrists, like Matt's wonderful talk. Uh, and some of these studies by some of my colleagues uh, on uh, some finger bones known from early hominins. But me, I'm interested in shoulders. Uh, this goes back years and years. I don't know why, but anyway, I've been interested in shoulders since I was an undergraduate. And uh, one reason uh, is because it's a fascinating part of the body. It is probably the most mobile joint in the body. And it's really that great range of motion that is possible at a shoulder that makes our upper limb such a wonderful uh, uh, structure for manipulating things, making things. Uh, with this tremendous range of motion, we're able to position our hand pretty much anywhere in space and do all the wonderful and interesting things we do with our upper limbs. Just a few examples. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the morphology of the shoulder for those of you who aren't anatomists. Uh, basically, we're talking about three bones. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, two of them in particular, but there are three that we want to concern ourselves with. Uh, of course, the arm here, that's known as the humerus, the collarbone, which connects the upper limb to the skeleton, uh, known as the clavicle, and then the shoulder blade, the scapula. So if you look a bit closely at uh, this set of bones, we can see that the shoulder, oops, sorry, uh, the shoulder joint proper is the articulation between this upper end of the humerus and the shoulder blade, the scapula, in this uh, joint here. That's what we call the shoulder proper. And the reason why we have such mobility is because the head of the humerus, the articulating part of the humerus, is so large compared to the very small and very shallow socket. This is a ball and socket joint, and those are the most kind of mobile joints in the body. And this one is particularly mobile because of the asymmetry in size and how flat the socket is. Another reason why there's so much mobility at the shoulder is that you can see this shoulder blade sits on the back. It sits on what's called the dorsal side of our trunk, and it's really floating in motion there. Uh, it's bound by muscles, of course, but it has great mobility itself. It's able to rotate in place or slide forward or backward a little bit, and because of that great mobility of the shoulder blade, that can move the whole shoulder joint in various positions to give you an increased range of motion in addition to what's possible at the shoulder joint proper. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, this shoulder blade sits on our back, and that means this socket for the shoulder joint faces out toward the side, faces laterally. And because it's facing out to the side, we're able to move our arm even behind our body. And really, that's part of the reason why we have such mobilities, because the scapula moves, the shoulder joint faces out to the side, and we're able then to move our arm all around in space. Now, so let's do our comparison, as I suggested. These are some early hominid uh, fossils. These are uh, two from... Lucy, a little bit of a shoulder blade here, a scapula, uh, a humerus, and then this is a clavicle, not from Lucy, but another uh, aafarensis uh, individual. And we'll do our comparisons. Here are the same elements of humans. And we can see, well, that's uh, okay. Uh, the clavicles, it's hard to say. The clavicle is kind of a weird bone. Uh, humerus, this one's all broken and smashed. It's not easy to make too many comparisons. I don't know about this shoulder blade. This, it looks a little different. It looks like the orientation of the socket for the shoulder joint, the glenoid fossa, is different here. And uh, maybe there are some other features that are not so obvious. Let's make our 
comparison then to chimpanzees, either the same elements in a chimpanzee. Uh, gee, it looks like maybe the orientation of the socket for the shoulder joint in chimpanzees is more like what you're seeing in a afarensis. Uh, and this, in fact, is a, is a feature that has been described and quantified. And it reflects an important difference between the shoulder complex of an ape versus that of a human. Uh, if we look at any ape, you'll notice it doesn't look like they have a neck. It looks like their shoulders are really high, and they are. They're positioned higher than they are in a human. And a human, our clavicle or our collarbone is fairly horizontal, where it's very oblique in apes. And their whole shoulder complex is, sits much higher on their rib cage than it does in humans. And this is partly also a reflection of the fact that their uh, socket, the uh, glenoid fossa, faces cranially. And this is because apes do this sort of thing. They're hanging by their arms a lot. Uh, and that's the reason why their shoulder is oriented differently than it is in humans. So how was the shoulder positioned in early hominins? Well, in the uh, 70s and 80s, people just sort of assumed that the shoulder of early hominids was probably just like humans. Uh, when they did these reconstructions, you see how horizontally the clavicles are positioned. And even though the glenoid fossa clearly faces cranially toward the head, they still reconstructed it as if it faced laterally like in modern humans. But more recently, people have come to recognize that, in fact, probably early hominids had a shoulder that was more like a chimpanzee than it was like modern humans. It seemed like probably the scapula and the clavicle still retained what's called the primitive condition, the condition of our ancestors. But from there, it was a straight shot to the human condition. So this was the general kind of view of shoulder evolution. Not a lot for people like me to do, because once you pass the early hominid stage, everything was just going to look completely modern. And along came Homo floresiensis. Uh, in this skeleton, now that you've seen many times, there is an arm bone, a humerus, and a clavicle. And when Mike contacted me about this humerus and described the upper end here, I was shocked. I said, he said, how would this work? And I said, it can't work. Now you say, how could you be shocked by a bone? I mean, it's just a bone. I mean, it doesn't look that odd to me. It looks pretty much like an ordinary humerus, right? And you can see it's pretty complete. Uh, there's a little bit missing down here, but we won't care about that end. This upper end, there's a big chunk missing from the front, but you can see some of the articular surface here, and otherwise it's pretty complete. Now, to explain to you why I was shocked, let me tell you even more about shoulder anatomy. So as I emphasized, the shoulder blade sits on our back, and that means that the socket for the shoulder joint faces out to the side. It faces laterally. Now, in order for the humerus to articulate with that laterally facing glenoid, it has to, be, has to have a head that faces inward. So if the socket is facing laterally, then the humeral head has to face medially or inward in order to articulate with that socket, right? When I say it faces inward, I mean relative to this end. We know that our elbows work like this, right? We flex and extend. That's how our elbows work. If we want our elbows to work that way, we have to have an articulation that involves a humeral head that faces inward to articulate with the scapula. And that measurement of the relationship between the orientation of the head of the humerus, the proximal end of the humerus, and the elbow end of the humerus is called humeral torsion. So if we look at non-human primates, this is a human from above. We're looking down through a transparent head. You can see that dorsally positioned their scapula and the shoulder joint. Here it is again in the humerus of a, excuse me, a human. Now this is a monkey. And this monkey is more like your dog, your cat at home, and having a kind of a rib cage that's deep from front to back, and a scapula or shoulder blade that sits on the side rather than on their backs. It sits on the side, and that means that the socket for the shoulder joint faces toward their chest. It faces forward, if we use anatomical terms. Now, if the socket for the shoulder faces forward, that must mean that for humerus to articulate with it, 
it has to face backward toward the back of the animal. So here is the scapula sitting on the side or lateral aspect of the rib cage with the glenoid facing forward and the humerus facing backward. And that's how it is in most mammals. This is pretty much the default condition you're going to find in any four-footed mammal you look at. Now, in, uh, if we were to have a humerus like that, here is a sort of cartoon of a rib cage, half of a rib cage, and a scapha that would be positioned on the back as it would be in us. If we were to have a humerus like that, with no humeral torsion, like this monkey, then our elbow would work out here in this plane. So in order to have a shoulder joint with a scapular position on your back and a laterally facing glenoid, the humerus has to undergo an evolutionary modification that's referred to as increased or high level of humeral torsion. Now I say it has to do that. It only has to do that if you care about where your elbow is working. If you want your elbow to work in this plane where we flex and extend, then you have to have a humerus that has a high level of humeral torsion in order to articulate with that scapula that's sitting on the back of your rib cage. Now some animals apparently don't care. Now that's kind of an anthropomorphic way of putting it, but there are other mitigating factors that in fact uh, work against having high degree of humeral torsion. For instance, this is what's known as a lesser ape, a gibbon. And if you've ever watched a gibbon in a zoo, you notice they sit around like this a lot, with their arms kind of splayed out to the side. And if you had x-ray vision, you'd be able to see that they have, in fact, very low humeral torsion. Their humerus is, it, the head of the humerus is facing backward relative to the elbow end, and that puts their upper limb in this kind of posture when it's at rest. Now, this at, turns out to be very useful to them in their normal mode of locomotion, which is arm swinging. But in terms of doing anything else with their upper limb, it requires they expend a lot more effort to position, to move that upper limb out of this position into something that allows them to pick something up or manipulate a food item. So whenever they do something, they have to do this rotation in order to get their hands into a more functional plane for manipulation. So if we had very low humeral torsion, this is the way our arms would sit at rest. And any time that we needed to do something, we would have to similarly use more muscular effort in order to rotate the arms into a more functional position. Now, we could do that, but whenever you require more muscular effort, you're using more energy. That's not a very efficient solution. Evolution tends to work to create a greater efficient system. So if you're a hominid and you're basically uh, making your living by making tools and, and, and manipulating objects, you're not going to have low humeral torsion and require excess muscle effort in order to do anything with your hands. So that suggested to me that there must be something going on because if we look at this humerus of LB1, and we measure the amount of torsion, it has almost no humeral torsion. It has something more like the primitive condition, a very low degree of humeral torsion. Well, how low is it? This is a chart which uh, tracks humeral torsion among our relatives, non-human primates. Up here we have uh, humans right there. You can see humans have a high degree of torsion. These are the African apes. They have a high degree of torsion also. Here are the lesser apes, the gibbons. They have very low torsion. And here are some various kinds of monkeys. And here's where LB1 falls. So LB1 has really low torsion. That's why I said this shouldn't work. I mean, you're gonna, they're going to sit like this. And then they're going to have to use a lot of effort to overcome that uh, low degree of humeral torsion. This is not a good solution. This is not what you'd find in a hominid if their shoulder was configured the way a modern human shoulder is. What about other fossil hominids? Uh, there must be others. Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, traditionally, to measure torsion, you need a whole humerus. Because uh, you're measuring the, the upper end, the proximal end, relative to the distal or elbow end. And there aren't any complete humeri known from any early hominid. Uh, but there are these. Uh, these are various fragments 
Uh, these are some proximal ends, uh, including one from Lucy, and this is one that is almost complete but is missing just the, the most proximal part, the head part. And several years ago, I had done a study where I found proxies for, some of the, uh, for uh, measuring torsion and had estimated how much torsion these early hominids had, and they fell right here. So they also had pretty low torsion. No, they're not quite as low as LB1. So I figured, gee, there's something more going on here. When I had done the study on the early hominids, I, I really hadn't gone very far with it. And now I said, gee, there's something going on here. So I better look at this in more detail because there must be something different about the configuration of the shoulder in early hominids than I had realized up until that point. So I said, well, what else can I compare uh, LB1 to? Because, okay, these are, the, these are uh, uh, the early hominids that we know of, but I need something more like a complete skeleton. And, and uh, you know, thinking that... LB1 came from some early form of Homo. There is a relatively complete skeleton known for Homo erectus in Africa, uh, the uh, KNM WT15,000 partial skeleton, sometimes called the strapping youth or the near Katomi boy. So I uh, decided to compare LB1 to uh, this skeleton in terms of humeral torsion. Uh, there is a complete humerus, although it is missing the most proximal part, the head, uh, because this was a juvenile and this was a growth plate right here and there was a separate growth center in the head and that the head has been uh, lost. But uh, still, it is possible to measure torsion by my very sophisticated techniques involving little bits of string and stuff. Uh, and when I did so, I found that this uh, humerus also had a very low degree of torsion. So how low was it? It's actually lower than LB1. So I said, okay, now, I've really got to figure this out. How could this have worked? What else can I do? I can look at these uh, fossils compared to other populations of humans. Okay, it's one thing to compare them to non-human primates, but what about variation within humans? Uh, and these are various uh, uh, populations that have had torsion measured on the skeletal material from around the world. We have some individuals of uh, very small stature, excuse me, uh, down here, some African pygmies, uh, some Southeast Asians, uh, Australian Aborigines, and then some modern Western population and a few others. And you can see torsion uh, varies, but, but pretty much they're all kind of the means values are hovering around about 140 or 150 degrees of torsion. And uh, that arrow is pointing to Neanderthals. They also have a fairly high degree of torsion. And then uh, early... Uh, members of uh, modern Homo sapiens uh, similarly have a high degree of humeral torsion. So where did the fossils fall in this? Uh, there is LB1. Uh, those are the early hominid fossils and then the uh, Homo erectus skeleton. So I think you'll see that they do really fall much lower than the averages of modern human populations and uh, something is different about this stage of human evolution, some early homo stage of human evolution, maybe even dating back to the Australopithecines. So how were their shoulders configured? We know that LB1 made tools. We know that Homo erectus made tools. Even Australopithecines made tools. How could they have had an effective upper limb if they had such low humeral torsion? Well, there is this piece still from the shoulder girl that I haven't talked about, and that's the clavicle. Uh, here is a uh, better picture of it. Here is it compared to a modern human clavicle. And perhaps you could tell that this is broken right here. This clavicle is not quite complete. So the first thing I had to do was try and estimate how long it would have been if it were complete. And I did that with some uh, uh, regression analysis, uh, looking at uh, uh, modern human samples and uh, finding a way of measuring what would have been there if it were the LB1 specimen and getting a, a way of predicting uh, total length from partial clavicular length. And I got a uh, predicted length for the LB1 clavicle of 91 millimeters, and this was just a demonstration of how good you can predict clavicular length from uh, this partial uh, length. And when I did that, then I... You know, just having absolute length is not that useful because we know LB1 is a small individual. We need a, some measure of relative length. And so I um, made a ratio of the length of the clavicle versus the length of the humerus. And uh, this is a very commonly used measure of, uh, of uh, segment lengths 
And we see a, in this graph some modern populations, uh, various statures, uh, all sort of having a fairly similar clavicular humor ratio. There's LB1, and there's the Nerokotomi boy falling really nearer to the apes, at least the African apes and lesser apes. Uh, orangutans are strange. Uh, in terms of uh, their clavicular humor ratio, sort of mimicking what you call the primitive condition. Uh, here again are Neanderthals and early modern Homo sapiens. Now, there is a scapia known, uh, not from LB1, but from another individual called, named, or named, numbered, LB6. LB6 has a fairly complete scapula or shoulder blade. Uh, and there are some features I had discovered some years ago that seem to distinguish humans from other uh, hominids and from uh, apes. And I thought, well, this might be useful to see how does uh, uh, Homo floresiensis compare in uh, features of the shoulder blade uh, compared to, you know, we saw that the clavicle and the humerus are seemingly primitive. Here are humans in terms of uh, this angle here between what's called the scapular spine and the axillary border. Those are the early hominins. Uh, they are more like African apes. And there's LB1 and WT15000, much more like humans in this particular metric. Here's another measurement. This is the orientation of the socket for the shoulder joint I mentioned earlier. They're humans. There's the early hominins, again, like the African apes, in primitive condition. And here's the LA1 and the Nerokotomi boy. Again, very much more toward the human side of things, in fact, almost hyperhuman in this characteristic. Definitely, their glenoid did not face cranially, it faced, I don't want to say out to the side, it faced downward. Nah, never mind, I didn't say that. I didn't. Okay, so. These two uh, specimens are similar in having very low humeral torsion, very short clavicle, and, uh, but a modern-looking scapula. So how did this all work together? Okay, this is where it gets complicated. I've got here, so again, those pictures of rib cages of modern humans, and I've got little cartoons here trying to describe for you what I think was the course of uh, shoulder evolution starting from something like an early hominid starting point, something like an afarensis or earlier, but I just call it a proto-hominin type of condition. Okay, from cranial view or from view from above like this, you can see the shoulder blades are sitting on the back where they do in apes, where they do in humans. Uh, here, this is an anterior view from the front. You can see them sitting on the back. And here's a view from the side. And you can see the shoulder joint with a cranially oriented uh, glenoid fossa a humerus with a fairly modest level of torsion, uh, a high position for the shoulder, a very oblique clavicle, but a relatively short clavicle. And this is where, this is what I think is going on with flores and with the early Homo erectus skeleton represented by the Nerokotomi specimen. When the shoulder descended from its high position that was as similar to apes, it didn't just go down, it was constrained by that relatively short clavicle so that it moved not just down but forward as well. The short clavicle meant that as the shoulder position dropped, the shoulder blades slid forward and came to lie on the lateral side of the rib cage, something more like the quadrupedal condition. Not that I'm saying they were quadrupedal, not in any sense at all, but only that the scapula sat on the side of the rib cage instead of on the back. And that meant that the glenoid fossa faced forward. And then to articulate with that glenoid fossa, you need a humeral head that faces backwards. In other words, you need one that has very low humeral torsion. So basically what I'm suggesting is that the relatively short clavicle, which is basically the primitive condition for apes and for all non-human primates, constrained the positioning of the whole shoulder complex as we move from a condition where the, the shoulder was, positioned, was high, as in early hominids, to when it was positioned lower, as it is in modern humans. But it didn't move into the modern human condition immediately. It moved into this sort of more lateral position as a, an intermediate stage in human evolution of the shoulder.
This is a uh, re uh, reconstruction of uh, the Flores hominid LB1 that was done by Elizabeth Denez. Excuse me if I'm not pronouncing that correct. And uh, notice how she just gave it a very modern human shoulder. Again, this is always what people assume. And this is uh, what I think, in fact, she might have looked like. I don't know if you could tell it's a very subtle difference, but, it, but the shoulders were positioned much more anteriorly. It was almost like she was like this all the time uh, because the scapulas were sort of more positioned in a front-to-back plane and the glenoid faced forward and the humeral head faced backwards. As verification of this, uh, after I had done the initial analysis, uh, the material from Demonisi in the Republic of Georgia was uh, described and, and published, and uh, included in that material are some humori from both juveniles and adults, and their descriptions indicate that the clavicles are relatively short and humeral torsion was very low. And just to put it in context of which we have been describing here, here is a uh, measurement of humeral torsion in one of the Demonisi humeri. So you can see it's, it's as low as what I've been describing for LB1 and for the Nerikotomi boy. Okay, so this is what I, this is unanticipated. No one would have expected there was any intermediate stage between this early hominid condition and modern Homo sapiens. What had to happen in order to get to the modern condition? Well, basically, all that you had to do was elongate the clavicle. By elongating the clavicle, then you could push the shoulders apart again and push the scapula back onto the dorsal part of the rib cage and have a glenoid that faces laterally in order to open up the range of motion. And, but, of course, to continue to have an elbow that works in the sort of normal direction, you need to increase the degree of humeral torsion. So basically, everybody had always assumed that there was a straight shot from the proto-hominid condition to the modern human condition. I don't think that's the case. There is an intermediate stage that has been revealed by analysis of the Flores material and by its other early homo skeletons. Or we can guess that possibly the reason for the initial shift from the early hominid high shoulder position to a lower shoulder position had to do with abandoning uh, use of uh, uh, trees in any regular uh, fashion. What were some of the possible selective pressures to uh, elongate the clavicle and move from this intermediate stage to a more modern condition? I think it's kind of fun to speculate what these might have been. Uh, first of all, before you can imagine, though, why we might want to change from that intermediate condition, yeah, I want to emphasize to you what the implications are of having the configuration I'm suggesting for Flores and early Homo erectus. When your scapula is positioned on the sides of your rib cage and the glenoid fossa faces forward like that and the humerus uh, or the facing backward, you're able to make tools and do all the kind of cool stuff you're going to do with your hands in you know, so this sort of area of your body. But you're not going to really be able to get your arms in that sort of posterior position that we're familiar with because the orientation of the shoulder joint is now only toward the forward realm of our body. And I tried to uh, illustrate this in this cartoon where you have a somewhat more limited range of motion. Uh, can you go back? Oh, yeah. Uh, with a intermediate flores type shoulder joint, your range of motion is somewhat limited. By elongating your clavicle and moving the scapula back and having the glenoid face laterally, you open up how much motion is possible at the shoulder joint and able to do all those wonderful things that we do with our upper limb. So what might have been some of the motivations for that uh, selective advantage of uh, uh, a longer clavicle to increase the range of motion? Uh, throwing is one. Uh, as long as uh, I think people have been talking about human evolution or at least evolution of the upper limb, uh, throwing has been seen as an important behavior contrib contributing to our survival. Uh, in order to throw something, at least in the overhand motion, you really have to be able to extend your arm behind your body and get it in this very 
peculiar position in order to have an effective drawing mechanism. So that might have been a reason to elongate the clavicles and move the shoulders into what we now recognize as our modern condition. Another possible uh, uh, reason for this uh, shift from the early homo stage to modern condition might be running. Now, this may not be obvious to you because you think running, that's what you do with your lower limbs. But when you run, your legs oscillate back and forth in order to keep your body balanced. Your shoulders oscillate in the opposite direction. And in fact, uh, there are people, notably uh, recently anyway, Bramble and Lieberman have suggested that running, or particularly endurance running, has been a major factor in the, the evolution of uh, HOMO, from the beginning of HOMO. Uh, but to have an effective counter-rotating mechanism, you need broad shoulders. In other words, long clavicles with shoulders that are widely separated. And at least what I've said here suggests that uh, early Homo erectus did not have broad shoulders. They had narrow shoulders because of their relatively short clavicles. So I don't think this, I don't think endurance running was at, the, you know, was the foundation for the evolution of Homo, as they're suggesting, but it may have been an important selective factor for the later elongation of clavicle you see in later human evolution. So, I think that uh, this analysis, as I said, of LB1 has actually revealed uh, something about the evolution of humans in general that we would have never suspected if they uh, hadn't had that skeleton. And I just want to take this opportunity to shift to a different reconstruction of uh, the Nerikotomi boy. This is an earlier one, but I don't know if you could tell from where you're sitting, but the scapula is actually sitting on the lateral side of the rib cage in this reconstruction. So I really like that one better, even though that's not the, most, not the accepted one right now. And uh, if we're, in terms of understanding the hobbits themselves, I think it supports an origin from some early member of the genus Homo uh, in terms of the ancestry of uh, Homo floresiensis. So there are various people I want to thank uh, who helped in terms of the analysis, in terms of providing comparative material. And of course, I also want to thank my co-authors and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's now time for a coffee break. I'd ask if you could please to return by 3.40 so that we can uh, all be in place for uh, Professor Bill Junger's talk on island dwarfing and the hobbits. Thank you very much. <laughs>